Welcome to the worship service for Sunday the 13th of September. Together we represent the congregations of the West End and City Centre of Aberdeen and we're delighted that you're able to join us for this time of worship. Taking part in leading our service today are myself, Jay Thomas, the Shared Youth Ministry Leader for Aberdeen West End Churches, Ruby Repper, an Elder at Midstock at Parish Church, Robert Smith, Minister at Ruby's Law Church and Tanya Webster, Minister of Midstock at Church. Wherever and however you're joining us today, you're most welcome. We begin our service with our call to worship. Merciful God, you're patient and kind, slow to anger and quick to forgive. Jesus taught us to forgive not once, not twice, not even seven times, but 70 times seven. So as we draw near to you, God, and we give you thanks and praise for your love and forgiveness, May you give us the grace to receive that forgiveness you so freely offer. Let's look to God in prayer. Let's pray. Hear our prayers today, O God. Hear the words that we sing, the words that we whisper, and the thoughts that we find it hard to share. For we come as your family, drawn from many congregations across the city. We are children of God, and we know your love a love that empowers our own forgiving, our own loving, our own caring, and our own serving. Use us, gracious God, as we offer ourselves in these gifts for the work of your kingdom, and draw us together in purpose and in strength as we share the words of the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The reading today is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Thanks be to God for the freedom from his holy word. Amen. Hello. The parable of the unmerciful servant is amongst the hardest parables we'll hear. Well, actually, the parable itself is pretty straightforward. It's, it's the reality the parable describes that's tough. It comes right after Peter's question to Jesus about how many times he should forgive. Jesus stunned him by multiplying Peter's fairly generous suggestion of forgiving someone up to seven times, all the way up to 77 times. 
And then Jesus illustrated the importance of forgiveness by sharing the parable of the unmerciful servant. It is helpful for us to note that a talent was equal to around 15 years of a laborer's wages. That means that the unmerciful servant owed his master about 150,000 years of labor, a sum he could never pay back. By comparison, a denarius was worth about a day's wage, which meant that the second servant owed the forgiven one about a hundred days of labor, still no small debt. But how could he possibly not overlook that relatively minor debt when he had just been forgiven an impossibly huge one? Hmm. The answer, I think, has to do with our fondness for counting and keeping track. Once the unforgiving servant's debt had been wiped clean, he immediately moved on to the ledger he was incessantly keeping and focused on the debt that was owed him. Now, he's not alone in this fondness. Notice where Peter started this conversation. He asked Jesus for a number. He wanted to know just how much was reasonable, how much was required. And then he suggested what he felt was a more than sufficient amount of forgiveness. But Jesus turned Peter's question on its head with a ridiculous, even impossible reply. Something like, hmm, so you want to play the number game, Peter? Okay, <laughs> how about this one? Now, it wasn't that Jesus wanted Peter to increase his forgiveness quota. It's that he wanted him to stop counting altogether. And that is because forgiveness, like love, is inherently and intimately relational rather than legal and therefore cannot be counted. Now, had Peter asked Jesus how many times he should love his neighbor, we'd catch this misunderstanding right away. Listen, love can't be quantified or counted. But Peter asked about forgiveness, and that's why we sometimes miss his mistake. I think that's because we tend to treat forgiveness as a response to the law. You know, when someone messes up, we can either punish or forgive that person. But I'm not so sure that's a helpful way to view things. You see, the law regulates behavior by holding us accountable to certain agreed upon values and morals, and in doing so, it makes space for our relationships to flourish. The law can declare to us that it is right to help someone in need and wrong to hurt that same person, but it cannot make us friends with that person, let, us, let alone make us love him or her. Forgiveness is an expression of love and ultimately is not about regulating behavior but rather about maintaining and nurturing our relationships. Now listen, I'm not saying that there's no place for the law in our relationships, because indeed there are times when we do need to count. If someone is repeatedly unkind, mean-spirited, or violent, we may very well want to put some distance between us. But even then, that decision doesn't completely define our relationship with the other person. It merely spells out how we conduct that relationship. We may continue to love someone who is abusive, but we don't have to put up with the behavior. Indeed, sometimes the most loving and forgiving thing to do is to stop putting up with abusive behavior. Now, at the heart of Jesus' parable is an invitation, an invitation to see that there are always two dimensions to our lives, and both are important. The legal dimension of counting and holding accountable, and the relational dimension of our lives that is not simply about behavior, but it's about being. God gave us the law to create space for good, and meaningful relationships. 
and God created in us the capacity to love and forgive and accept forgiveness so that we might be drawn into relationship with each other and with God. All of which brings us now to the rather harsh ending of the parable. Hmm. It seems that the only thing this forgiving king cannot forgive is the inability of others to forgive as they've been forgiven. But let's consider this. That rather than inflicting some, some form of punishment on the unforgiving servant, the king is really describing the condition his servant already lives in. Jesus is showing us that the unforgiving servant was already a slave to the world of counting and calculating everything according to the law. And he would remain a slave to that way of being until he could somehow come to forgive others. Forgiveness is a decision about the past that ultimately determines the future. When we forgive, we release the past and enter into an open future. And when we cannot forgive, well, we remain captive to that past until the end of time. So really, friends, forgiveness is freedom. It's freedom from the past and freedom for the future. The kind of freedom God wants for each of us. Forgiveness, like love, cannot be commanded. It cannot be forced. But we can pray for it. For the ability to forgive those who have hurt us even if we have distanced ourselves from them for good reason. We can also pray that we forgive ourselves some of our own regrets, some of our own mistakes and the hurts that we experience and know. Above all, we can pray that God keeps bringing us back to a place of understanding so that we may know God's intention and promise to us to forgive us and to continually shape us into a community of love and forgiveness and grace. Amen. Our hymn this morning is, Forgive Us, Help Us Forgive, Forgiving Lord. If you have your hymnal with, the, with you, it's hymn number 693. Let's continue to worship together and sing.
Let us pray. Compassionate God, we praise you because you are a God whose generosity knows no bounds. We pray for the worldwide church in all its diversity and we bring before you situations where this diversity has resulted in argument and broken relationships. We bring before you your broken church and all those from whom we are separated by differences of doctrine, tradition or memories of past wrongs. Heal misunderstandings and encourage mutual respect that your loving grace may be more fully revealed. Forgiving God, we pray for the nations of the world in all their variety and we bring before you the places where that variety is a source of friction and violence. We bring before you those driven by zeal and anger to acts of terrorism and war and their victims. We bring before you those who stir up hatred through the media. Forgive our intolerance of those who differ from us and bless those actions which foster peace and reconciliation, that your grace may be more fully revealed. Steadfast God, we pray for the community in which we live for the resources we share and hold in common, for workplaces and homes where trust has broken down and unkindness holds sway. We bring before you those driven by poverty, sickness or despair to steal or harm or kill. And we bring before you those who are burdened by guilt and memories of past wrongs. And we bring before you those who have wounded us and those whom we have hurt or offended ourselves. Stay faithful when we are unfaithful, that your unfailing grace may be more fully revealed. Compassionate God, we bring before you all who suffer in any way and especially those who suffer through broken relationships and lack of forgiveness. We hold before you those in our own hearts who are in any sort of pain. Bring care and wholeness to all who suffer that your healing grace may be more fully revealed. These prayers we bring in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose example of loving forgiveness we seek to follow. Amen. Now may you love and serve God by loving and serving one another. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with each one of you and those whom you love, near and far away, now and always. Amen.